Hi, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever you're joining us. Uh, I'm Dr. Eric Stansbury, and I'm welcoming you this morning or this afternoon to Restoration. So glad that you're with us. Today we're going to be singing a song called uh, In the Shelter of His Arms. We're going to be looking at the word and the danger of rejection, the danger of losing out. And it's in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, all of that will be there. So glad that you're with us today. Why don't you phone a friend or email somebody and say, hey, Restoration is on the air. Listen to the words of this old song that says, I'm sheltered in the shelter of his arms. Oh, there is peace 
Douglas here with me today in this study in the Word of the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. We're going to begin today looking at verse 26 as we look at the topic of the danger of losing out. The danger of losing out. For if we go on deliberately and willingly sinning after once acquiring the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice left to atone for our sins. No further offering to which to look forward. There is nothing left for us then but a kind of awful and fearful prospect and expectation of divine judgment with the fury of burning wrath and indignation which will consume those who put themselves in opposition to God. Any person who has violated and thus rejected and said it not the law of Moses is put to death without pity or mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse, sterner, and heavier punishment do you suppose he will, be he will be judged to deserve who has spurned and has trampled underfoot the Son of God, and who has considered the covenant body, blood by which he was consecrated common and unhallowed, thus profaning it and insulting and outraging the Holy Spirit who imparts grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of God? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, retribution and the meeting out of full justice rests with me. I will repay. I will exact the compensation, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will, his judge, determine and solve and settle the cause and the cases of his people. It is a fearful, formidable, and terrible thing to incur the divine penalties and to be cast into the hands of the living God. No scripture, with few exceptions, has caused more people to wonder, can you lose your salvation? Can you be saved and then lose it all? Growing up, in the holiness movement, we, for some reason, got the idea in your head that you can just lose it all through just one little sin. However, this is not what he's teaching here. And I want to bring balance to this doctrine, so I'm going to make the attempt to stay in teaching mode, but anything's possible. When he's talking to the people, he's again, the book of Hebrews was written, written to Jews who had become Christian, who were now to the point of wanting to give up. They wanted to just be done. And part of that, part of that problem that they ran into was how do you deal with the persecution, deal with the problems, when it is just easier to go back to Judaism and say, hey, I'm sorry, I was wrong. So when the apostle or whoever wrote this was writing to this church, he understood that there is a real danger of rejection after reception. Rejection after reception. He says, for if we will sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, what is the sin? There's one sin you cannot be forgiven for, and that is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Everybody agrees with that. There's no, no matter what denomination you are, everybody agrees with that premise. The only sin that you cannot be forgiven for is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. What I want you to be aware of, what I need you to, to focus on, is that the Holy Spirit calls us to repentance. Notice what John said in John 17, or Jesus said in John 17, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. We are, once we have been revealed by the Holy Spirit who Jesus is, what his plan is for your life, what he wants in your life, once that's been revealed to you, you're now held accountable, responsible for that information. Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Colossians 1 and 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in, in the knowledge of God. The part of the salvation experience is that you now have access to a relationship with, with God the Father. You have a relationship with Him. That's the knowledge. And you've met Jesus Christ. He's now your intercessor. He's the mediator. So when you gain this knowledge, when you get saved, and that's the knowledge that you have and you've been recreated, there's nothing that you can go back to. There's nothing back there for you. Yet, many people, many uh, individuals will find themselves giving up turning away, or apostatizing. That is to leave the faith. That's not, there's a difference in backsliding and apostatizing. 
a pop black backside and you may not have the relationship, you may not have the love, you may not have the desire that you once had for Jesus, but you don't deny that he still is the Son of God. Apostasy says, I don't believe any of that anymore. I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't believe in God. And you just go right on down the line into false doctrine. So that once you have known Jesus, once you know who he is, when you allow the world, when you allow anything to turn you from that knowledge, whether it is persecution or whatever, you have nothing else to go back to. Peter says, if, if these things are yours, and he's talking about adding faith, love, peace, those things, knowledge, into what you're doing, into your faith. He goes, when you've added those things, that you are, and they abound in you, you will neither be useless or unbarren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You won't be barren. You'll be producing fruit. So as we move into this, this part here that says, you know, it's a fearful thing to be in the hands of an angry God. That was the, the sermon preached by Jonathan Edwards that triggered a revival in this country. The idea, the understanding that you need, that I need, is that there are three things that he's trying to bring to your attention. If you reject his truth, it, there isn't anything else that's going to work. If you reject what Jesus Christ did on the cross, if you reject that sacrifice, there's nothing else that will save you. There's no formula you can follow. There's no religion you can go to. There's no mantra you can chant. If you trample underfoot and say, his blood's not enough, his power's not enough, I, I need something else. There are many people that are walking a very fine line between trampling the blood of Jesus underfoot and staying saved because they think it's them plus, them plus, them plus. If you reject his truth, there's nothing else that can save you. If you reject his truth, I promise you, on the authority of this word, you will die lost. You say, well, Brother Eric, I go to church. That's not saying that you've accepted the truth. That's only saying that you've accepted that you're going to church. Going to church is not going to make you any more of a Christian than me going and standing in my garage is going to make me a car. I still will be a human being. When we reject the truth of God's Word, when we reject that, when we reject the Holy Spirit's calling to us, when we reject Jesus Christ, we die lost. Every believer has had the same grace, the salvation, impartation, faith, whether they're a believer, every human, the worst person you can think of, still have the same opportunity, the same ability of grace to get saved. But not everybody accepts it. They reject that truth. If you reject his truth, there's nothing else that works. If you reject his truth, you die lost. And if you reject his truth, you will experience the wrath of God. We know there's coming a time upon this planet that the scripture calls the great tribulation, and I'm not going to get into what that is, and I'm not going to talk about mid-trib, post-trib, or pre-trib, but what I'm going to tell you that there's going to come a time when people on this planet that have rejected his truth, that have rejected what he's given them, will face and be exposed to the wrath of God. He says that right here. He says in verse 30, For, I, for we know him who said... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people, verse 31. It, it, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's a lie. And it's a fearful thing because when he's made all of these things available to you and to me to come to him, to know him in the free pardon of sin, and yet we reject that truth, there's nothing left to be done. We will experience the wrath of God. If you once walked with Jesus and now you've said he's not real and you're, or you're dabbling in witchcraft, you're dabbling in what name, the, the thing, and you're trying to, or you're trying to do it on your own apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, you're trying to make your own way of salvation, you're trying to come up with your own plan to get to heaven, you're going to die lost. It's Jesus only. You accept the blood of Jesus Christ as sacrifice. You accept the terms of adoption. Then you become a believer. Now you have access. Not to leave you on a note that has you going, well, that really is terrible, Dr. Stansbury. I don't like you anymore. Let's look at verse number 32 and going down. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great suffering. 
you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. First thing that the writer says is, hey, I need you to recall what you had. Recall what you had, what you have. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but I want you to pay attention to what he says. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Has blessed. Now, I don't know what you learned when you were in school, but when I hear the word has blessed, that tells me, that indicates to me that it's in the past tense. So he's already done it. He's already given you everything. You look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. For his divine power has bestowed on us, and this is in the Amplified, absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Can I just tell you this morning, friend, or whenever you're watching this, everything that you need to do what God has empowered and called you to do, you already have access to it because it's already been put in place. It's already been given to you. The problem with many believers is they're so busy begging and pleading, they don't know that it's already there. I've had to learn this through experience and through God's word, that so many times we're asking God to do, to do, to do, to do, and God says, I've already done, to done, to done, to done. Let me give you an example and again. In Exodus chapter 4, in Exodus 3, Moses is introduced to the I am, the great I am. And he says, who shall say, sent me? God says, I am that I am and sent you. But yet Moses continues to argue, I'm slow of speech. I got this problem. Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. And it's yada, 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 yada. You with me so far? But then something interesting happens. God asks him a question. Here's the question. What is in your hand? What is in your hand? Moses said, my shepherd's staff, throw it on the ground. And it becomes a snake, pick it up again. I personally would have passed out at that moment, but pick it up again, it's a rod. You say, what are you saying? A lot of times God has already given you what you need. He's waiting on you through faith. And, when we, and you're going to see how this is rolling into as we move to 11, the great hallmark, the great hall of fame of faith. What faith really is. Faith is not name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. But faith is saying, I know God has already done this. It's been settled in heaven. And because it's settled in heaven, it will manifest here. I have to begin to praise. And we're going to talk about praise and worship. I need to hang on and get what is coming. You see, when the, when the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2, Peter said this was that which was prophesied. It was already told. You see, prophecy does one of two things. It either tells the future or it instantly changes an, an, a, that moment. When you have, a pro, when you have an, an, an encounter with Christ, it changes your future and it changes your situation right now. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 tells us that the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Yeshua, is the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus came to change your life. And we keep saying, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet, and we've got everything there, and think, well, I'm going to live down here in gloom, despair, and agony. But he said right here in Ephesians and in Peter, I've given you everything that you need to make it. I've given you every tool, every weapon, every anointing that you need to be successful. So stop walking around saying, when's God going to do? And say, Father God, I thank you that you've already done. You say, well, I need to be healed. Well, if you read again in Peter, it says, by his stripes you were healed. God already sees a lot in your life as being done. He's waiting for you to get to there. When Elijah had got had given out the great prophecy that brought the uh, great drought 
to the kingdom. He went, the God said, I prepared for you there. And the ravens fed him there. And then he said, hey, I want you to go there to the widow of Zarephath. God has your there. So many times we stop before we get there. We stop knocking before the door opens. We stop praising God before it comes. We need to understand that he's already given you the healing you need, the power you need, and the anointing you need to win the battle. So he has to remind these believers of what you of the battles you've already won. That's a testimony. Do you know that some people can be healed in a church service, not because a six-foot icicle laid hands on them, but because of a testimony of another saint? A testimony that says, I needed healing. I was lost. I, I had this problem or the other, and Jesus healed me. And Jesus changed me. My situation. I don't know if you're if you're grabbing hold of what I'm saying, but he's reminding you and I today, if you've made it this far in life, if you've made it this far and you're on this side of eternity, God has something for you to do. And he's waiting on you to get to your there and say, I receive by the Holy Spirit the anointing. I receive. You understand that we do a portion of all that Jesus did. Jesus had that direct connection. You don't read a lot of times where Jesus had to pray. He prayed at Lazarus's tomb, but then he said, Father, I'm not praying for them to know that we pray. I'm just letting them know that we've already had a conversation. You, you understand that God has had already told Christ what he was going to do and had made available to him all of the power that he needed to do. And then when Jesus said at the end of Matthew that all power on heaven and earth is given to me, go you therefore. Who goes? You go. Who's a witness? You're a witness. I'm a witness. Would you like to be a witness to? The, the beautiful part the thing that we fail to see, the thing that we don't even bother to grasp is that we're praying for something and God goes, well, why don't you claim it because you've already got it, but you're still chasing your tail. That's why when Peter says that he's given you absolutely in the Amplified, absolutely everything that you need to live godly. But what do we do? We do everything we can not to live godly or not to have it. Everything you need to live in victory has already been given access to you. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. For whatever is born of God, or whoever in some translations, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, as we get into the end of 10 and into the beginning of 11, you're going to understand that faith is not this name and claim it and, and, and making things up for God. Faith is saying God made a promise. He does not lie. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that is true, then what he did then, he does now. If he healed then, he heals now. If he set free then, he sets free now. If he takes care of needs then, he takes care of needs now. He's not changed. The only thing that has changed is that now we have been given an access to the innumerable riches of Christ to do our faith overcomes the world because we know our faith isn't in ourselves, but our faith is in someone greater than we. His name is Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 4, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. He said in his word, I am with you always even to the end of the age. He said in another place, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Have you ever wondered why then we go to church and why we come to prayer meeting and beg God to show up when his word says he's already there? It's the receiver, it's our ears, our hearts that have to get into a place to hear him. But God says, I'm going with you. I'm always going to be with you. 
The problem with many believers is that we've, we've bought into this lie that we have to beg and plead and you know, almost like the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel, cut ourselves and go to all this rigmarole. But if you'll go through that prayer that Elijah prayed, he said, let the God that answers by fire. And he said, God, let these people know that you, he wasn't begging God. He said, let them know that you are God. Sometimes you just got to remind your storm, remind your mountain that it's not you they're dealing with. It's not you they're messing with, but they're messing with a son or daughter of the king. And if they, that problem, they have a problem with that, perhaps because the Bible says I am seated in heavenly places with Christ, then maybe why don't you talk to my daddy? Why don't you talk to the father and tell him what you said you, Mr. Evil Spirit, were going to do to me? Many of us would begin to walk in victory, true victory, if we took that Romans 8, 31 and 32, said, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely Give us all things. Now, before you run out and say, I'm saying that you can win the lottery, that you can get the spouse you want, the job you want, you need to understand that God has a will for your life. And when you get into the place where it is less of me and more of him, when it's his will, not your will, as Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. When you begin to pray that way, when you know that he's already said you're healed, you know that he's already said, I want to take care of you, that you will have success. If you may not have a million dollars in the bank account, but your needs will be met. It comes to the place that you and I need to get off the prosperity train and get on the Jesus train and say, I know my Redeemer lives and he's going to take care of my every need. But yet, many believers, many Christians will live beneath their privilege waiting for, waiting for something else to happen or occur. So he says... Remind yourself of the victories you've won. Sometimes you're going to have to look in the mirror and testify to yourself. Sometimes you're going to have to look in the mirror and say, I am the righteousness of Christ. I have been healed. I have been anointed. He's anointed me to do things. He's anointed me to speak his word. He's anointed me to be his child. He's anointed me to be what I've been called to be and then be that. The second thing that he reminds us here is to learn to move in worship. Learn to move and operate in worship. A true intercessor, when they come before God in worship, is more focused on the God that we serve, not the mountain that we're facing. Notice what happens in Habakkuk chapter uh, 3, verses 16 through 19. When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and no herd in the stalls. Now, if we stop there, that's the majority of most of our lives. We look around, and we have this apprehension on the wrath that God will be pouring out on those nations who do not follow him, who forget him. Yes, we understand that because of the sins in America that at some point in time, God will pour out his wrath. But I believe that he's held back a lot of that wrath because there's still a remnant of God's people praying for revival, praying for God to move. But that remnant is getting smaller and smaller as the apostasy begins to take hold. So he has an apprehension on this great, great uh, wrath that's coming. He says that the trees are bearing no fruit. There's no grapes for wine, so there's no food, there's no wine, there's no crops, there's no wheat for bread. There's, we're seeing the shortages even now, but there's still no shortage on God's love and mercy. There's no sheep, there's no cattle. It becomes very easy to say, we'll focus on the bad. And there are many ministries that will focus on what's going wrong. But let me show you what Habakkuk says next. Yet, I will rejoice. Yet, I will 
will rejoice. Yet I will rejoice. Some of you need to get a hold of it. You're looking at all your problems and your problems are looking back at you. Why don't you look at your problems and begin to rejoice? He goes, I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. Do you hear what he's saying? The Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high heels. He will make me walk on the very mountain that the enemy sent to stop me. He will make you walk on the very over the very storm. And Jesus even said that you will tread over serpents and scorpions. We know from Genesis 3.15 that Jesus crushed, destroyed the head of the enemy. What am I trying to get you to? When you begin to move in worship, when you begin to walk in worship, when you begin to make the choice, I wish somebody would amen me. If you're watching later, put an amen in the comments. But he said, I'm choosing to worship God. And he's my strength. He's going to make me walk up this mountain to the other side. But so many people today, we look at worship as what we got to get to, and we, and we minimize it. We're going to sing two songs. If the Spirit moves, yay! If the Spirit don't move, okay, we're moving on. Then you've got people, because they don't live a lifestyle of worship, it takes an hour or an hour and a half to get them worked up to a shout to raise their hand and to cry. But I will make this assertion. Many of them will go watch their favorite sports team. They don't have to be worked up to a shout. They don't have to be begged into a shout. But they walk in and go, my team is great. You know I'm telling the truth. But what he's called us to do is to live and walk in worship. He said, do you have more scriptures for that? I do. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Notice what Paul writes. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and every good thing give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice. You're always praising God. You say, well, sometimes I don't feel like it. Quit listening to your feelings. Praise God anyway. You begin to praise God. Then he says, pray without ceasing. I'm not saying that you walk on your knees, but all throughout the day, you can have constant contact with the Father. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, help that brother there get healed. Lord, let the Holy Spirit touch that one. Minister to that person over there. And when you and I get to the place when you and I get to the place that that is our lifestyle, that's the will of Christ, that's the will of God for you, that you live a life of rejoicing, a life of prayer, and a life of thanksgiving. Colossians says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it, in what? The faith. With thanksgiving, your faith should trigger a worship response. Your faith should trigger you praising God. When you and I get to the place that praising God is our natural default setting. Remember, Jesus told the Pharisees, if they don't praise me, the rocks will praise me. Understanding that rather than living a life of gloom, despair, and agony on me, living a life that says, I have been set free. I've been delivered. The hold the devil had on me, he ain't got no more. I've been delivered. Another one I want you to look at, and, and get your Bible and look at this and underline these next phrases. Let the high praises of Psalms 146, verses 6 through 9. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. He goes, two things need to be in your life at all times when you go into spiritual warfare. This should be in your life at all times. One, the high praises of God. The high praises of God. 
You should walk around saying, I know my Redeemer liveth. We, we, we sing, a lot of churches will sing a song next Sunday for Easter. They'll go like this. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what men may say. And we go there. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my snare away. He lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And we'll sing that, but we'll sing it like we're at somebody's funeral. Rather than saying, hey, guess what? He's alive. He's alive. He's sitting on the throne. His spirit lives in me because his spirit lives in me and I have constant contact with him. I can begin to sing praises. So when I face the enemy, the first thing I'm going to do is start singing. I'm going to start praising God. And then it says a two-edged sword in their hand. The Bible says of itself that it is sharp and sharper than a two-edged sword. What are the two edges of this sword? There is first of all logos the very spoken word of god the second one is rhema that's when you are coming to agreement and speak that word when you begin to come into agreement with god and what he's already said that becomes a two-edged sword the enemy does not know how to behave when you start talking like the father the enemy doesn't know what to do when you start talking like the father when you begin to declare and say i have been set free i've been healed my family has been healed the devil don't know how to act so i'm asking you today no matter what you're going through don't throw in the towel don't walk away from the faith don't allow the enemy to tell you that it's jesus plus this or that but say it's jesus and i'm gonna make it because he died on the cross for my sins hide me behind the cross Paul would say, I don't, it's not me that's alive, but Jesus lives in me. And when you get to that place in your spiritual experience, you'll begin to walk in constant victory over your circumstances. Are you always going to have, a, always will have sunshine and roses? Nope. You'll probably have a storm shower and a, a thorn now and again. But he wants you to live in that victory. The first thing you need to do if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior You've got to believe in your heart. You can say, Father God, I come before you in the name of Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner lost, but your word says if I call upon you, if I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead and that you did all that for me because you love me and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then I can be saved. Lord, I repent of anything that's got in that way. And if you're here and you're listening and you say, well, my relationship isn't what it needs to be, then shake yourself off and say, Father God, I'm coming back home. And, I tr and believe me, he'll do that for you. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your power, your grace, and your glory. I pray, Father God, that you'll reach out today and minister and touch to everyone that has listened to this message today through your word. We're going to give you praise and give you glory and give you honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hey, stay tuned. I'm going to be right back to make a couple of announcements. To pray one more time for you and tell you how you can contact our ministry. So thank you, and we'll see you just a minute. I'm so glad that you joined us today. I hope that the word was a blessing to you. Hey, if you're liking the new direction that we're going, we're making some changes with the green screen technology and, and different ways and some different things that we're doing. Would you please email me at pastorstansbury at gmail.com and let me know that's also where you can reach us for any of your ministry needs. I'm looking for some partners to help us begin to continue moving forward. Uh, the ministry has need of a new, of a new computer for editing, uh, some more camera software. Just be in, be in prayer what you can do. And if you'll reach out to me, at pastorstansbury at gmail.com. I will be ever so grateful. And I'll just tell you, here's what we need. And if you want to just buy it outright, uh, we'll be very thankful for that. We'll give you, of course, the receipt for that. So thank you so much. Until next week, which will be Easter, Resurrection, this is Dr. Eric Stansbury saying thank you so much. Remember that God wants to multiply grace and peace to you and that he wants to restore what you've lost. Have a great week.